right, uh, Second Thessalonians, uh, chapter two. But I still don't know if you're live. You don't That's know it. Life. Okay, gotcha. There's a 40 second lag. Oh, so, man. yeah. I lived my whole life that way. <laughs> Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, and we're going to read uh, verse 13. <coughs> but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. God hath chosen you from the beginning. The concordant reads it this way. Now we ought to be thanking God always concerning you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, seeing that God prefers you from the beginning for salvation and holiness of the Spirit and faith in the truth. Paul's presenting to us, and he does this repeatedly through his epistles, that we have a calling. God has elected us. God has called us. We have a calling of God. God is not haphazardly working His way through time. Figuring out on the cuff. Figuring out what His creatures are going to do, and then what He's going to do. God has not lost control of His universe. God knew from the beginning all that He was going to accomplish, including the opening of our eyes to the truth. Including you and I being here today and enjoying this time together. God has a definite plan and He's masterfully carrying out His predetermined purpose. I'm going to read you just a few verses quickly. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4 says, He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation or disruption of the world. Ephesians 1.11, Being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who works all things after the counsel of His own will. 2 Timothy 1.9, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world or before the age began. Listen, this is not just something God did after you were born. And somewhere in the stage of our life, He looked down and said, Well, boy, she's doing pretty good. He's doing pretty good. I, I think I'll save them. The fact that we can hear and see today is because God has called us. God has a plan. God's plan does not... Now, now we talk about... Before I say that, we talk often about one of the wonderful things that we get to share with folks is the, is the ultimate salvation of all mankind. What a wonderful truth. What a great comfort to know that God has a plan for all His creatures. He's not going to leave any of them stranded in their own free will. He's not going to leave any of them stranded to some kind of eternal punishment. God has a perfect plan for every individual. But you need to understand this. It is not God's current purpose and plan to save the masses. It is not God's purpose today for the masses to see and understand and to know Him. That's not God's present purpose. By the way, if it was God's present purpose, God does exactly what He wants to, when He wants to, how He wants to, because He's God. That's a, that's a description of being God. When you're God, you get to be in, in control of everything. Yeah. And if God's present purpose was to, was to save the masses and to open the eyes of the world, the masses would be saved. You wouldn't need missionaries to accomplish it. You wouldn't have to, to trust other men to get it done. God would make sure that was done. And the reason that so few people see and understand God and His truth is because God is now only calling a few. It has always been God's plan through the course of time that He would, that he would call a few to do His purpose. It's a training ground that God is doing. Uh, we notice in Matthew chapter... I'm just going to read you a few verses. We have, we have limited time this afternoon, but you can jot them down. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. 
It says concerning the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, Thou hast hid these from the wise and the prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Two acts of God going on simultaneously. God is opening the eyes of some and revealing himself to them, a very definite divine act. And he is also, at the same time, deliberately closing the eyes and the ears of others so that they cannot see. And they're going on at the same time. And just as surely, and we need to remember this, and when you're sharing the truth and you're trying to present some information to someone, and we all love when they have that moment and they say, oh my God. And they really mean that. <laughs> they finally get a glimpse of who God really is. And you know what? We rejoice about that. We say, wow, that was the work of God. You also need to remember that when you're sharing the truth to someone and they profess they can't see it, that is as equal a part of the work of God as was the other. When folks' eyes are blind and they can't see, and you're showing them a verse that's as plain as can be, and when they say, I just can't see what you're saying. I don't get it. You can... You don't have any reason to doubt that they're lying to you. They really can't see that information. Now, why is that so? Why is it that God is only calling today a few? A remnant, if you were. He's calling the elect. And that's because, in fact, one of the words used to translate this idea sometimes is a word called election, which is an interesting word. We have elections in the United States. And we have elections and people are chosen. And they're chosen because they, they have a job to do. They're chosen to fulfill a function and to carry out a duty. And our calling before God is much the same way. We are called to do something. God has called us to a function. And by the way, that function is not so much right now. That calling election is not so much about what we're doing right now. What we're doing right now is training us and preparing us for something that God has elected us, called us to do. And He's drawing us to Himself before the rest of creation that we might get to know Him and understand Him so that He could use us in this service. He told Israel when God was working with them, He told them why He called them. He didn't call them because they were just like this great people. You know, you are, you are some of the best people in the whole world. Some of the best people I ever made, and so I call y'all guys. I want you to be my nation. In fact, you're so massive and powerful, I want you to be my nation. In fact, it's the opposite, isn't it? He said in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 7 that He called them because they were the fewest of all people. They were a puny bunch. Just like Mark was talking about earlier. God's ways are not our ways, are they? The way He does things. He tells Gideon, you got way too many people. And listen, you know, when you think about Ammon he had to begin with, but the fact is, the Scripture says that the army they were, they were going to fight was innumerable. They couldn't even count them. There were so many. And they had too many. God's always dealt with a few. It was eight people that God saved on the ark. Eight against a whole world populated with people. This is just God's standard. We need to learn, just as Martin showed us earlier, that those stages, that, that three-act play, we need to understand God's methods, and we need to understand how God works. Listen to just, I'm going to read you just a series. You can write the verses down if you want. I'm going to read you a series of verses that talk about God's choosing. And we're going to start back, actually, in the Old, in the Old Testament. Let me put something on the board here first. God's initial plan was with Israel. And notice some things he says. He says in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 5, God hath chosen him out. And then he talks about Israel. And he says, to, to stand, to minister in the name of the Lord. They were called to do what? To minister in the name of the Lord. Deuteronomy 21, 5. Them God hath chosen to minister unto him. 
First Chronicles 15, uh, verse 2. Them hath the Lord chosen to minister unto him. First uh, uh, Chronicles 28, 4 says, And hath chosen Judah to be the ruler. First Chronicles 28, verse 5. Uh, the next verse says, He hath chosen Solomon to sit upon the throne of the kingdom. Notice in every instance, we got some ordinary, in every instance, it has to do with service. It has to do with reigning. It has to do with sitting on a throne. Second Chronicles 29, verse 11. And the Lord hath chosen you to stand before Him and to serve Him, and that you should be a minister unto Him. He says in Isaiah 43.10, My servant, speaking of Israel, My servant whom I have chosen. He chose them to be His servant. You see, the fact that God has chosen anybody to begin with, He chose Israel. But the reason God chooses anybody is not so that we can just have special benefits above everybody else. Oh, aren't we special? We get all this, all this wonderful things, but it's because we've got some work to do. God called us as an advanced team to do some work. Notice he also says in Matthew uh, chapter 12 and verse 8, he says, My servant whom I have chosen. You'll notice over and over in the usage of the word choosing or called, you'll always see this idea of service in its context. John 15, verse 16, I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit. He says in Acts chapter 9, verse 15, speaking of Paul, he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name. Being chosen of God is not just some kind of favor, not just some kind of lofty uh, uh, benefit that's given, but it is a place of service. It is a place to do something God has called us to do. And, and one of my favorite passages is Isaiah 43.10. If you're not writing any of them down, write this one down. Isaiah 43.10. And it says this, My servant, whom I have chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Notice, notice what election's about. It's for three things. He said, I've chosen you that three things. First of all, I've chosen you so that you may know. No, no, number one. And number two, that you can, may believe, and both of these are me, that you may know and that you may believe me. And then he says, and three, understand that I am he. Boy, that's some great truth. You know why we've been called? We've been called so we can know who God is. Amen. I want to submit to you that this handful of folks here, and I don't mean exclusively, just as Alan said, there's there's folks who watch on the, uh, uh, a video, there's probably people all over the planet in different little places here and there. But, but, but this is representative of how small it is, though. <laughs> I mean, it took a lot of states to get this group together. <laughs> okay? And that shouldn't discourage you. Right. right. It should encourage you. It should encourage you of how unique this calling is. Amen. And you and I have been called to know Him, and I'm going to tell you, we are the only ones who really knows who God is. Yeah. The religious system doesn't know and understand Him. Now there are some in those groups that God is calling. And you know what? It's wonderful. Sometimes you often hear this when folks begin to see the truth. They always say, you know what? I always knew. I always knew something was wrong. I always knew God was better than that. There was something in them that God was already trying to begin. He was already beginning to reveal Himself. We get to know Him. We get to know Him. And 
We get to believe Him. He says it. We get to believe what He says and to, look at that, and to what? And to understand. There are a lot of people on this planet, and I submit to you that there are very few people on this planet have the foggiest idea of what's even going on at all. About anything. <laughs> I always drive behind him too. They <laughs> drive right behind him. So. They have no clue. We have we have masters and doctorates of all kinds of things, and they have no clue what's going on. And God lets some really dumb people in on on all this. <laughs> Amen. And now what Paul said? He did, he's not picking the wise and the noble. Right? He's picking the foolish. He's picking dumb people. You know? <laughs> he's picking nobodies. Yep. Not somebodies. Yep. You know? I mean, look at us. <laughs> trying not to. <laughs> We're a motley crew. <laughs> And you know why? So that none of us will boast. Right. <laughs> We're not smarter than anybody else. We can't read better than anybody else. We don't study better than anybody else. There's a lot of people read. There's a whole lot of people read better than I do. I strive to read because I got a passion to know information. I struggle at reading. I struggle at writing. You know, I can't believe that I write. <laughs> Earlier this morning, I was reading that BSN on 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 the Grey's Anatomy. Yeah. I can't believe I wrote that. <laughs> I was reading that. It was actually blessed me. And I was like, did I do that? I'm like Urkel, right? Did I do that? <laughs> wow. <laughs> he picks us. Because what hope is there in us that we're going to be bragging about anything? <laughs> we're going to be thanking Him. That He lets us know Him. Are you kidding? We pass all the ornate churches <laughs> and we get to know Him. We say that, you know what? That God you're talking about is my dad. <laughs> I know him. One of my favorite pictures of the Oval Office is John John laying under the desk. The most powerful man in the free world. So there's a little boy running around playing. He's got intimate relationship. Yeah. They talk about it. We know it. You want to talk about the scriptures coming alive? The scriptures indeed do come alive when you know the author. Paul says, "You see, religion religion satisfied knowing about God." And we get to know his heart, his character, his nature. We get to know what drives God. Paul says that this was the passion of his life in Philippians chapter 3. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Now, let's talk about this calling of ours. We're called to serve. And I'm going to submit to you that that service that we've been called to is not primarily what we see around us. I'm not asking you to do anything. This message is not about you waking up and doing something. The fact is, God's preparing you now to do something later. Now, you might be doing something now. <laughs> and it looks good. You might be studying. You might be sharing the truth. We might be writing books. This is all preparatory work for what God has in store for us. Great verse. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the next verse says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth. And then we
we start moving through the revelation of God. You know, we wouldn't know anything about creation. We wouldn't know anything about the plan of God. We wouldn't know anything about this universe except what we could perceive through, through our scientific studies. We wouldn't know anything if God, unless God chose to reveal Himself and His plan, His history, and His future to us. Unless God chose to reveal it. And He revealed it in the Scriptures. And God created the heaven, and God created the earth, and immediately God begins to reveal bit by bit, piece by piece, here a little, there a little, He begins to reveal His plan for the earth. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth, and the earth, and God's focus is constantly on the earth. And God calls a man by the name of Abraham. And God tells Abraham He's going to give him land on the earth. And that He's going to populate and be a blessing to all the other nations on the earth. And He's going to have a government on the earth. And He's got a promised seed that's going to come that's going to rule on the earth. The earth. The earth. That keeps being the emphasis that God does. And God's selecting a few people over time among a little nation called Israel. And among this little nation, God is beginning through the course of human history, God is beginning to call out a handful of people out of a little nation who are going to be His elected instruments to reign and rule with Him when Christ establishes His government on this planet. And I know some of their names. And you do too. And they're not noble people. They're fishermen and the like. And God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, took 12 men. And those 12 men are going to sit on 12 thrones. Literal, physical, earthly thrones. They're going to sit on them and they're going to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Literal, physical, earthly tribes. These tribes are going to be over the nations of the earth. This is God's calling. God has called them to serve it. they got work to do. And their time spent with the Lord Jesus Christ in His three and a half year teaching ministry was training time. They were getting ready. It was their boot camp. But there's a whole part of God's revelation that He kept a secret. And he didn't talk about it. He kept talking about this. Until he called a man named Paul. Actually, his name was Saul, man. And God revealed the rest of the story. You know how God tells stories. Martin already told us how to tell stories. He always says the bigger, better stuff for last. You know, you ever look at the universe? You know, you ever look out at the expanse? You look out at all the stars of heaven, all that expanse that's out there, and you realize that the earth is like this little speck, really insignificant place, and that's where God's going to do some great work with the nation of Israel, but there's a far greater expanse that He never talked about, and that God gave a message to Paul about this place. Laura was saying earlier, that when she started being interested in spiritual things and scriptural things and started reading Paul and she reading Ephesians, she keeps saying heaven, heavenly places, heaven. Kept reading about the heavenly places and said, you know what? I think there's something to this. I think Paul, I think Paul tried to tell us something. I think something's going on. I think it's big. You know? And she tried to tell the preacher or whatever, and he said, Yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, whatever, you know. She began to see that Paul was talking about something else, and it was a big deal. And I want to tell you what the little people who live on the planet are only a part of the creation that God's made. Not only does God have creation on the earth, but He has a creation in the heavens, mm -hmm. in the celestials. Mm -hmm. And just as surely as the creation that God has on the earth, needs to be managed and ruled and introduced to their creator at, for who he really is 
and to bring forth righteousness, so the heavens, the celestials, need that same introduction. And thus there's where our calling comes in. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14 says that we have a high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The concordance says that that, that calling is above. Not below, but above. Am I doing something? No. <laughs> All right. Can I do anything better? Anyway, so now, our calling, let's, let's, I'm going to write. I'll know in about 40 seconds. Here's something, here's something that we, our calling is celestial. It's broadcasting. Not only that, but our allotment is celestial. Just like Israel, when God called them, He took them into the land of promise, and in the land of promise, the land was divided up. The King James will use re repeatedly uh, a, a word of, uh, the word of inheritance. And the land was divided up into portions, and every portion of that land was given to one of the twelve tribes. And then among the twelve tribes, each family got a portion. That land was broken on down and divvied up. It was called an allotment. In the middle of the word allotment, you see a lot. Everybody got a plot. Everybody got a lot that they were in charge of. They were in charge of managing and being stewards of that allotment. And, and the Old Testament's filled with that information. And if there was some kind of mismanagement of that lot and it had to be uh, given up for some reason, did that fix it? I can talk loud enough. Sure they can hear me. Anybody hear me? Okay. Now, so, and, and if they somehow through mismanagement lost control of their lot, that lot, what? Every Jubilee went right back to where it was. Because this allotment belonged to who God gave it to, and they were responsible to it. Amen. Now Paul picks up this same principle and begins to apply it to you and I as members of the body of Christ. And just as Israel had that little territory in Israel divided into lots, and it was given for them to reign and rule in, so the celestials have been already by God divided up into allotments that you and I are to be a part of. Let me read you just really quickly a couple verses. Verse, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. That the eyes of your heart being enlightened for you to perceive what is the expectation of His calling and what is the riches of the, enjoy, the glory of the enjoyment of His allotment among the saints. Titus chapter 3, verse 7. That being justified in the one's that one's grace, we may be becoming enjoyers in expectation of the allotment of life. You know, Is that what's happening? Anybody got double A's? Anybody got double A's? C3's. Not only is our calling celestial, our allotment is celestial. Half times. Does that make it truly or something? Okay. We're going to get done here whether it works or not. <laughs> not, not only do we have we have a heavenly or celestial calling, we have a, he a, a heavenly or celestial allotment, but one of these days we're going to have a celestial occupation of the allotment that God has given us. You want to talk about a big day. You want to talk about a big day when God gathers His call and He takes us to that place. I was, watch I was, I was born and raised in Hampton Roads area, Virginia. And um, one of the things that we, 
I would do uh, ever so often. We go lots of historical places in that area. Got Jamestown and Williamsburg and all kinds of places. And one of the places I like to go, probably went more than a half a dozen times in my childhood, was the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial in in downtown Norfolk. And they took the they took the uh, the, the city old city hall, which was a dome structure, and General MacArthur's buried there. And you watch a film of his of his life. And, you, and he was the he was the supreme Allied commander. Wow, <laughs> the supreme Allied commander. I mean, let me tell you what he was top dog. He ran the show. And when Japan surrendered, not only was he in charge of their defeat, but when they surrendered, he was in charge of their country. And if you're old enough, you know. He, he went over as the Supreme Allied Commander to rule Japan. Japan turned, in, it turned out to be a pretty uh, nicely constructed nation. And because of General Douglas MacArthur. And now what's interesting is that when he got there, there's a, there's a movie just recently came out and I watched it and with Tommy Lee Jones and it's called The Emperor. And it's about that little time period between Japan's surrender and when General Douglas MacArthur finally uh, set in all his operations and they were trying to figure out what to do with all the current rulers <laughs> that were in Japan, the ones that had surrendered. <clears throat> <laughs> if this doesn't work, nothing's gonna work. So. Nick Mila in the broadcast. Okay. And this movie deals with, I think, like a ten-day period where they figure out they're trying to figure out who knew what, who was in charge of what, and what emperors were corrupt and and, and what. You know the, the the power structure that was, and what they were going to do with them, where they're going to execute them, what they're going to do with these people before before they 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 begin to take over this country and do what they're going to do. You know, and I always loved those pictures of General MacArthur when I, when I'd see him in the in the thing. You know, so he's got his hands right here, you know, and yeah. pose, and he's doing this, you know, and and and, and it shows he shows all this all the strategy that needs to take place to figure out how to take over this territory as the supreme. Allied commander, you know, and you you take the you take those maps of the country and you roll them out and you put the anchors on the corner and you figure out what's the strategy. Now we are, now we have a whole country, and what are we going to do and who's going to be in charge? And they start pinning up on the wall the pictures of who's used to be in charge here. This is the guy who used to be in charge. These are all the little guys. He had this territory. What was he doing? What was his role? What are we going to do with him? Who's going to go where? And the Supreme Allied Commander got it all rolled out. And he's in charge. <laughs> well, I submit to you that the Supreme Allied Commander, and I'm going to rephrase it, I'm going to submit to you that the Supreme Celestial Commander, Paul, mm -hmm. is going to roll out the scroll. Yeah. And he's going to put the anchors <laughs> off of the scroll of the Celestial. And you're going to say, all right, you've got some work to do. Now, here's who was who, here's all the here's all the ones who were here before you got here. Now we're going to learn a little about them. This is a quick lesson, pay attention. And here's what we're going to do. And hey, you're going here. You're going here. Here's what we need you to do. Occupation. Occupation of the allotment that is currently under the control of disobedient principalities and powers and lights. Yes. And we're coming in the house and to take over and to establish the righteousness of our Father whom He is now teaching us about. <coughs> I would like to tell you that, that's all going to be fun and games. But what I'm going to tell you is that everything you're going through now and everything I'm going through now is to teach us to trust God, to know Him, 
to understand him so that we can be his representatives in the celestials. This is our boot camp. By all means, don't waste your boot camp. Pay attention. And I'll tell you what, it's not only boot camp, it's officer's training. And you need to pay attention. You need to get it. You need to know who God is. You need to trust Him. And when the hard times come, that we stop murmuring and complaining, and we look to Him in thankfulness, knowing that He's training us to do a far greater work for Him one day, this is all the stage acting. It is all the rough practice run of some work that God's going to have us do. I'm going to read you three verses that will remind us not to waste the training that God is giving us for these allotments. The first one is Romans chapter... I'll just come down here so we can read them quick. You write the verses down. Romans 8, 17. And if children, then enjoyers of an allotment. Enjoyers indeed of an allotment from God. Yet joint enjoyers of Christ's allotment. If. If. So be. That we are suffering together. That we should also be glorified. Together. We've got to suffer. We've got to go through the hard times. A boot camp. This is all it is. Right. Keep your eye on the prize. Right. <laughs> we're moving. We're moving to a high command. Listen to another verse. Colossians three twenty four. Being aware that from the Lord, from the Lord you will be getting. Listen. From the Lord you will be getting. Oh, oh, that's us. From the Lord you will be getting the compensation of the enjoyment of a lot. God's going to compensate us. With an allotment for the Lord Christ, you are, or are you slaving? Colossians 1.12 At the same time, giving thanks to the Father who makes us, I love this part, who makes us competent for a part in the allotment. He makes us confident. You know how confident I am? <laughs> <laughs> to go in. Can you imagine? I'm just trying to get that feel of General Douglas MacArthur, Supreme Allied Commander, stepping on the shores of Japan, a now conquered nation and people. And his whole goal is restoration. He is going to restore this he wants to restore this to a glorious nation in spite of all that had happened. And can you imagine the, the, the staff that came with him and the soldiers who came with him? How would you even begin to do such a thing? How would you even begin to understand this realm? And I'll, I'll tell you, I'll be the first to tell you, I have no natural competency for such a task of the celestial. I couldn't even do it on the earthly level. <laughs> but the verse says he's making us competent for a part of this. He's doing it. He's training you right now. He's getting you ready. And those things you mulled most about and complained most about they're probably going to be the vehicle of the greatest part of him making you competent. Don't waste your trip.